Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, for How Would You Recover? Lessons from 2016's Most Interesting Disasters. So, as usual, I'm going to start with uh, just some, some basic housekeeping for the session. Uh, we are scheduled today for 30 minutes, and that does include time for some question and answer at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, type away in the box on the right-hand side of your screen using GoToWebinar. Um, I won't be able to get through any of the questions during the session, but I will endeavor to go through at the end. And I promise, despite saying this, uh, for the last two webinars that we've run where we've, we've run short on time, I think we should have some time today, so we'll, we'll try to get through those. If we don't, for whatever reason, um, we do promise to always get back to everyone individually. Um, and if we've got any really interesting questions that we think would benefit everyone, we'll, um, we'll pop those up on the, on, on the blog. Um, but I will say we're, one of the things we're very hot on here is making sure we're tight for, tight for time. We stick to our 30 minute schedule. So um, it's 30 minutes today. We'll make sure everyone can, can, can get off um, for half past two. So I'm going to do a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so first, before as a bit of an intro, I'm going to give a, uh, a, an overview of the common causes of data loss uh, in 2016, certainly the most, the most interesting things that we've seen. Uh, we're then going to look at uh, an examination, so a detailed look at six real disasters suffered by Data Barracks customers in 2016. We're going to look at those and we're going to see what mistakes led to that disaster or that data loss or that incident. Um, whether anything could be done to help prevent that. Um, and then we're going to have a look at some recommendations for what can be done to become more resilient, how we can improve recovery, if that's, uh, if that's the, uh, the issue that we need to look at. Um, and I will answer the question here now, is it usually the, the first question that gets asked on a, a webinar? So we will make these slides available for everyone uh, following this session. Um, and also, we'll, we, we are recording the session, so um, we'll send you out a link to that if, uh, if, if you want to refer back to it later. Um, so. Before we, uh, we hop into all of that content, I want to start with a couple of plugs for a couple of, uh, of initiatives that we're involved in. So uh, the first one is uh, a podcast that we launched last year called the Business Continuity Podcast or the BCP Cast, um, which you can find it's on iTunes or you can go to the bcpcast.com. Uh, and we went out and we interviewed um, business continuity professionals in some really large organizations, so folks from The Economist, uh, from BP, Fujitsu, London 2012 Olympics, and really what we wanted to do is get uh, their insights as to why they got into the industry, um, what they find interesting about it, and, and try to take some stories um, out to everyone else. I think we, we as Data Barracks, deal with a lot of businesses, a lot of smaller businesses, who wouldn't necessarily have a great deal of interaction with a true business continuity professional, and often, I think, look at business continuity planning is something that's um, a long, long way away. But uh, one of the things that's been terrific during the podcast is that actually all of these um, these professionals are incredibly uh, down to earth, very sensible people who have some really uh, common sense practices that can be applied. You don't need to be BP, the size of BP, to be uh, applying some of these practices. Um, so have a listen, it's really interesting stuff. Um, and particularly, I would like to point to episode number five, which is Total meltdowns and the emergency planners paradox. So, bit of a mouthful. We spoke to we spoke to lots of folks and we asked them all, um, "What's your uh, most interesting disaster that you've been through personally?" Um, and I will say there is a a chap that we um, that we interviewed who had been working in banking in the city of London throughout the 80s and 90s. He'd been through multiple terrorist threats, uh, but actually his Probably his most interesting story is something he refers to as the suet pudding incident, um, which has a lot of parallels with some of the incidents we'll be talking about today. Uh, so have, have a look at that one in particular, and, um, and, and, and please enjoy. Um, now, the second initiative is something that we launched uh, earlier this year. And similarly to uh, the issue of, of, of people having disasters and having, um, having incidents, there's there's a, an overwhelming urge that people don't want to share this kind of information. I think often um, we feel like sharing the stories of what went wrong for us can make us look uh, incompetent or make us, uh, make us look bad. But in actual fact, it's really important that we do this because it's really important that we share all of this information um, in, in business continuity planning and dealing with all of these incidents that, that we're dealing with every day. Uh, the one thing that's common to them is they're, they're all really uncommon occurrences, um, 
but it's very, very rare that any of these would be uh, what we might call a, a true black swan event, something that completely couldn't been uh, anticipated. Um, but it's very difficult if we're if we're performing a, a risk register, as 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 you, as you may be doing, where you're looking at a kind of outage and trying to work out what's the likelihood of that happening. It can be really difficult to estimate. Is it going to happen perhaps once in every ten years? Is it going to happen once in every twenty years? Um, and I think often the feeling that we have when we talk about um, disaster recovery, the feeling is that we say, oh, well, that, that could never happen to us. And I think that's going to be a common theme that runs through all of the recoveries we're talking about today. Um, but equally, it's it's very often people will not um, want to talk about what the cost of downtime was to their business. So we had some some inquiries from um, from a couple of businesses who had been looking at a survey that we published and they said, this is this is really interesting, um, but do you have any really specific uh, detail about what downtime costs for me as a business of X number of people um, or me as a business in this particular industry? Um, and we've looked into uh, some some surveys, some stats, some, um, some reports that people have done into the cost of downtime. Very often, they, they approach downtime costs from a different angle. It might be from uh, network downtime or data center downtime. So what we want to do with this project is bring together all of that information in one place so you can evaluate all of those different sources and see how it fits for you. But we want to go one step further than that. We want to uh, to ask for all of you as the IT community for your, uh, your input. Uh, we'd like you to um, fill in a form, send us across your details of what, what exactly happened to you when you've worked out uh, your cost of downtime, what, what methods did you use and, and, and how did that work? Or if you've had an outage, did you work out a figure beforehand, but actually it, the, you know, the, the real impact was very different afterwards? Um, and over time, we want to build this data up and we want to be able to publish it so that um, we can all look at it as a benchmark that uh, we can look at as from a, a certain type of business and everyone else can have have their input on so please take a look at that that's the cost of it downtime.com so starting then with uh, the background so the shape of the kinds of recoveries that have occurred in the last uh, in the last kind of year and what what's been the biggest cause of data loss now we've been running um, uh, a survey called the data health check and we've been running that since 2008. Uh, and one of the really interesting things that, that comes from that, that um, running the same questions over a, over a long period of time is we get to see some really interesting trends. Now, one of the questions that we ask every year is, what was the leading cause of data loss for you in the last year? Um, of course, you might have several others, but the leading one, what's the one that's, that's most significant? And since 2013 to 2016, I mean, this is a trend that we certainly all talk about all the time when we're dealing with with uh, with, with with our customers and saying, look, cyber instances are obviously um, a, a, a growth area for downtime. But um, this is a really significant trend we're seeing from 2004. It was just 4% of those recover of those significant causes of data loss uh, were cyber attacks. In 2016, it was 9%. Now, the kinds of recoveries that we see really, really frequently are often around ransomware, which we will talk about shortly, but um, obviously something to be wary of. And in particular, although this is only 9%, there's obviously a, a, a lot of other different kinds of recoveries. Uh, what we would say is that cyber incidences tend to be the ones that cause the most difficult recoveries. But how does that fit um, overall in, across, across all the other types? So uh, in 2016, 9% of businesses said that the leading cause of data loss for them was cyber attack. Comparably, hardware failure was attributed to 16%, but still way, way out in front, as it always is, is human error, which is 23%. Um, and that's something we're going to, um, I think we're going to illustrate with a couple of the, uh, the, the case studies that we're looking at today. And just before I launch into our examples, I think uh, something interesting, um, a very interesting recovery occurred, um, which I'm sure everyone has seen in, in, in the tech press. Uh, if you've not uh, it, I'll, I'll give you a quick background about, about GitLab, but this, this occurred in the interim between us planning this webinar and actually today. So on the 31st of January, uh, GitLab, which is a, a code management and repository service, um, had an outage. Um, now, initial reports thought that this might have been a cyber incident. Um, on further inspection, it turned out that actually it was just a regular run of the mill uh, user deletion, accidental deletion of, of some data. Now. At this point, you would think that that's fine. We, you know, we've all dealt with this kind of issue. We can, we, we should be able to uh, manage that. That should be a relatively easy recovery. Uh, certainly, it's the kind of thing that we do every day a great deal. Um, but this is where the story got quite heartbreaking. So, 
when they came to start going through their recovery process, they found, and this was published because the one thing that GitLab did terrifically well was publish um, exactly what they were going through. They're incredibly transparent. Um, so of the five backup and replication techniques that they had in place, none were working reliably or set up in the first place. So this is uh, comes directly from their report. So they had issues with LVM snapshots. Um, they had regular backups that were taking once per every 24 hours and then some, some manual ones that were more frequent. They had uh, Postgres dumps that weren't working correctly. They had snapshots in Azure for certain servers and not for others. Synchronization problems, um, some shell scripts that weren't working well and were badly documented. Uh, and then when users were looking for where those backups were, um, they were empty. Now, that's an awful situation to be in. Thankfully, they did manage to find the data. There was The data was hiding somewhere on a staging server, um, but there were two, uh, I guess big lessons that, that you know that, that we can take away from this, um, and that's what we'll be doing today. We'll be we'll be giving some recommendations. I mean, the first thing we would say is this was an incredible level of transparency from a business to um, to to be very honest about exactly the process they were going through as they were recovering. This was published while the recovery was still going on. They then went on to live stream their recovery. So uh, when I was watching, there were five thousand other people watching. Uh, this business live stream and try to get themselves back online um, and overwhelmingly the feeling at the time was um, this is an incredible level of transparency we, we, we have to respect that that's very very good um, but certainly from from our perspective the one lesson that we would take from this is that it doesn't matter how many um, different kinds of, of technologies you've set up to, uh, to, to, to to protect yourself whether it's backup or replication technologies if you haven't tested them you, you really don't know if, if, if they're going to be successful or not so our first lesson is certainly to test um, and I'll leave with just just before I jump on the examples the last stat from um, from last year's data health check so we asked have you tested any element of your DR process in the last 12 months now 45% said yes uh, the remainder said either no or no but we're going to and I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide as to whether or not those those people did actually get around to recovering but um, certainly would say lesson number one is always always going to be testing so Preamble over. We're going to jump now into the examples. So how would you recover? And I want to give um, just a little bit of context for this. So uh, Databarics as a business, we have around a thousand customers, predominantly in the UK. Um, so to give you some perspective on that, that's we're not looking at an enormous sample size of thousands and thousands and thousands of customers. Um, these are issues that really can and do happen to all of us. Uh, and really the reason we want to, to share this is because um, I think overwhelmingly the feeling for both the users in these situations and probably all of us is that we think this won't happen to, to me. Um, and so the examples that we're going to run through today, they really are, from certainly from our perspective, the most interesting recoveries. Um, these aren't necessarily always the, the big bang ones. Um, we certainly we've had we've had those, but these are the examples that I think probably we can take some lessons from. So I should jump into the first one. And actually, this is the only of, of the case studies we're going to talk about today that I can actually name the customer. And that was because they were um, good enough to do a, a case study with us for this. So this is a company called Major Players, who are a, uh, a recruitment agency in London. Um, and I think they are the, uh, the country's largest recruitment agency for marketing uh, professionals. Uh, and they suffered from a ransomware attack. And I want to start with this one because this is pretty much the best case scenario for recovery from ransomware. Um, so I've got a slide here. It's, this is the uh, the diagram we used when we, we, we showed our how to recover from ransomware webinar. So this is how it works. You have an installation of the, of, of the ransomware. It contacts the command control server to create the, uh, the encryption key. It then searches across the network as far as it is able. It performs the encryption and then ping, you get a ransomware screen that pops up. Uh, and at that point, you need to you need to go and find some either pay that ransom or you need to, to to find a backup of that data. So in this case, let's say about as perfect as it could be. The user contacts IT. IT contacts us. We have a recent backup. We perform that restore. Uh, user permissions are all very good, so the 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 the, the ransomware hasn't been able to get very far. Um, and we bring that data back with next to no data loss and um, and no outage, no downtime, it can all be done um, nice and easily in the background. So that was really, really good. Now, what you might say at this point is that's really, really good, but we shouldn't be focusing on recovery. Uh, wouldn't it be better to be focusing on prevention of ransomware? And, and of course, obviously, that's, that's really, really important. Um, 
but I think we have reached a point certainly as a business where our recommendation um, to everyone that we work with is uh, ransomware has become so prevalent it's no longer possible uh, with with a number of cyber threats to um, to not plan for an infection um, I think we, we you should assume that you will have an infection um, and then you should look at your mitigation policies so how can you make sure that damage is limited in that case uh, and in particular for this business now um, this is a recruitment company so all of their staff are receiving an enormous number of unsolicited emails from people that they don't know on a daily basis uh, and because this is an agency that work in in marketing they're receiving a high volume of odd file types so it's not just uh, a CV that's a, in a PDF form it'll be it'll be CVs but there'll be uh, Adobe Creative Suite files there will be um, web files all sorts of different design files so the likelihood of people in that high paced uh, environment being absolutely perfect all the time yes we can we can educate our users but the likelihood of them not uh, ever clicking on one of these emails is really really low so certainly for us the lesson that we can take from this is if you do work in that kind of environment um, for whatever reason where you have a lot of users that will need to open attachments from no, unknown sources it's pretty highly likely that this is going to happen to you so how do you limit that damage of a ransomware attack uh, how quickly can you recover your data and how much data would be lost so look at your recovery point objectives and your recovery time objectives um, now the next example I'm looking at and don't worry these aren't all going to be ransomware examples um, but is the other end of the spectrum so if that was the absolute best case recovery of, from ransomware this is about as bad as it can get so imagine going through this process um, the installation all, all of the all of the above to get to that ransomware screen except that three weeks prior to this all occurring the IT manager has left that business and a replacement has not, not yet been hired so obviously in, in this case I think you can imagine this is a much smaller business um, but you've really got a problem at this point so the other issue that happens here not only had the IT manager left but the person that left wasn't a particularly good IT manager although it was a small business um, the entire organization had admin access so everything had been encrypted so even for a small business you're talking about a large volume of data that needs to be recovered um, it wasn't the volume of data that you could take back over over an internet connection so that for us means writing off that data at a data center getting an engineer to career at two sites um, dig out the ISOs for those servers um, and do a completely fresh install bring all of it back um, and well I guess we'll, we'll get on to something else in a second but the lesson certainly I think we can all take from this because the, probably the feeling is that well that's a small business we certainly wouldn't have any of those issues but there's a lot of um, th th there's a lot of lessons that we can take from it uh, I would say firstly and this this certainly happens we know at much larger businesses what do you do if the person or people responsible responsible for your IT aren't available if you want to expand that to a larger business not just IT but what about the people who are responsible for recovery are not available um, even even in, in, in medium-sized businesses certainly we know of a case where you're running on a very small in-house IT team um, but the likelihood of, of, of them not being around at a time when when needed is pretty high and, and how do you recover in, in that instance who else is able to do so um, the second question then here is hopefully uh, none of the businesses with with on, on the webinar today uh, have everyone with admin access but do people have more access than they absolutely need I mean certainly we see this pretty frequently and it, it's highlighted with ransomware um, where it's ex it's it's extended further than it really needed to be um, certainly when you look at that as a threat that's one of those those issues that, that needs to remind us that we should be uh, we should be careful with how much access we provide uh, and then the final issue and this is a little separate from recovery altogether but do you remove access properly for leaders when we came in and did that recovery it was still clear that that IT manager that left three weeks before still had access from from wherever he was so just a, a minor note there is something that I think we all should be thinking about uh, case study three is a bit of a change of pace on this one um, so we've talked about some very specific digital cyber threats here um, this one however is a very physical incident um, and it's stolen servers now as an example I think this probably of all of the ones uh, that we're talking about today is is probably the one we would all say this definitely couldn't happen to me our, our building is too secure um, our, our locations too obvious our, our 
our, our server room is too visible. Our data center, you, you couldn't possibly steal this, this, steal our equipment. This wasn't a small business. This wasn't um, a business that didn't have any security practices in place, and they had a, a, a very large uh, robbery of, of, of equipment. So we're talking multiple servers, uh, storage, networking gear, and significantly in this case, they also took the backup server. Um, so there's a few things that obviously um, change for this kind of recovery. Um, to start with, you need to recover data onto hardware that isn't there. So uh, how quickly can you source new hardware if you're recovering on site, if you're recovering obviously in a, in a data center, in a, in a DR situation, that would be slightly different. Um, how quickly can you recover when you've lost your local backup server that has uh, a copy of all of that data, which means if you've got it, it's great. You can you know you can bring that data very quickly. But if that's been taken, um, you, you know you're, you're you're reverting to to your offsite copy. Um, there's also the, the the pretty major issue here in that this is a data loss in the sense that you don't have it <clears throat> as you would do if you'd accidentally deleted it. But it's obviously also a data loss in the sense that someone else has that data. Um, and I think probably we're all very very good nowadays at um, making sure we encrypt data in transit making sure if we're transporting anything that that data is encrypted but certainly I know a lot of a lot of businesses won't um, employ encryption at rest in their own data centers so you've got an issue here where someone has that data um, that's a breach that that obviously may need to be reported to the ICO it may need to be reported to uh, any other regulators um, and potentially you may need to be reporting that publicly to your customers anyone who's been involved in that breach now that's a that's a very very different kind of recovery because this isn't just a, a minor embarrassment for an IT department but a really significant embarrassment for the business so um, the lessons I think we can take from this is how secure is your server room and your data center uh, <clears throat> what do you have in place to protect that is it do you have CCTV have you got access controls in place um, is there any possibility of, of data loss through physical removal of your hardware, which I think probably for most people there certainly is. Um, how long would it take you to source that replacement hardware or second, you know, if you were recovering at a second site? Um, and then there's a separate issue here. Uh, would you be able to uh, recover if you only lost a small subset of systems? And so the reason I've added this in here, um, very often um, businesses will plan to have, I can recover perhaps one server, or I can recover everything. Uh, I'll do a full recovery of my entire site somewhere else, particularly if you're using a, a, a disaster recovery service. Um, often you won't be able to recover certain groups of applications, or if you do, it might perhaps be a, a, a V app or a, a kind of a logical set of applications. In this case, the hardware that was stolen was the hardware that was easiest to steal. It, it didn't necessarily uh, match with that grouping. So um, how would you recover from those different subsets of systems? It's obviously something that's worth um, bearing in mind for your, for your disaster recovery planning. Uh, example number four, this is a quick one, and this is a really odd one. So this, um, Again, hopefully something no one will be suffering here, but when we when I talked to all of our engineers and we said what are the, you know what are, what are the different um, recoveries that we've been making recently, this is one that I'd, I'd never heard of before. Um, and this was a case of an administrator who was making some changes and, and had a had an accident. They um, had an error with the permissions on the file system, and they left uh, basically all of the data available to everyone in the organization. So not a really small business, but not not an enormous business. Um, this is a really simple thing to fix. You can simply restore those permissions, um, get everything back to normal. Um, but the, the interesting part here in this case was that actually it took a really, really long time for anyone to find that out. Uh, when you have a significant outage, if, if a server goes down, you know you're going to hear about it from a user pretty quickly. Um, if something like this happens where people just have a bit more access than they should do, uh, I think very often that, um, that first feeling from, from the people is to, to, to see what they can see. Um, and so in terms of the lessons from, from this as an example, I'd certainly say, how long would it take you realistically before you found this out? Um, how honest do you use this to get in touch and say, uh, should I be able to see all of this? Um, and then what would be the impact if all of your employees had access to, obviously, to all of that sensitive customer financial and HR data? Uh, so shifting from this one, because this was just a quick one, uh, and I want to look at another very physical incident. Um, and I think, to be honest, this is probably my favorite of all of the all of the ones we're talking about today because it's completely separate from technology altogether. So this is uh, a business that had their building contempt, so not related to IT at all. Um, the premises were deemed unfit for use, albeit temporarily. 
Uh, they were forced to work from an alternative premises while the structural issues were addressed, uh, and then the building was uh, reassessed, reapproved for commercial use. And in that interim, that business had to use its DR systems, which it hosts with us. So uh, we recovered their systems and, and, and brought them back up. But there were a few things that were, I think, were interesting in this case. Now, this business had planned to use disaster recovery for. Um, a short invocation for if they had uh, a problem with their, their servers that were down, they had a hardware failure and they needed to operate for a small number of days, not for an extended outage. And as a result, the planning meant that they had uh, enough licensing for a skeleton staff. They didn't have enough licensing in this case to have all of the staff working remotely for, a, for, a, for an extended period of time. So um, it was an interesting example of an invocation that in, in every one of these cases, I think we can certainly learn what you know what we can improve and how we can do better with those recoveries. But um, uh, this one, um, it, it is interesting to me because during the process of talking to all of the, the interviewees for the Business Continuity Podcast, I think one of the um, the overall messages that came up time and time again is that you should do impact-based planning rather than scenario-based planning. Uh, and what that means is rather than planning for 100 different scenarios that your business could go through, all the different different possible configurations of, of, of risks and, 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 and things that could happen. You look at a really, really small number and you say, well, you know, what's the impact on the business? And you can use those, you can do those really simply. So you can say IT is out, is down. You don't have access to your premises. And that could be for, for any number of reasons. It might be that you've had the building condemned. It might be that there is, um, there is flooding. It might be there is a demonstration going on outside or a bomb threat, but any reason. And, and it means that you can, um, you can limit the number of things that you need to plan for and then plan accordingly. And obviously one of those is is, is not having access to the premises. Um, and the one thing I would say here is, uh, excuse the photograph that I'm using as, a, as an example, but this wasn't a, um, this wasn't a small business that was working in an old industrial building or, a, or under a railway arch somewhere. This was a, a large white collar professional services building, uh, a business that operated out of a rather old building in the city of London. Um, so, Again, one of those things that I think probably we think wouldn't happen to me, certainly can, does happen to people. Uh, so the lessons here are, what would you do if you lost access to your premises? Um, and does your plan account for everyone using it? Um, so obviously we, we, have, we, we tend to think about skeleton staff, skeleton teams to, to get us by in a disaster. But uh, if you're talking about some kind of extended outage, how, how would you get by? At what point do you bring everyone else back in? And so the final uh, case study that I want to run through is, um, is a, it's a combination of all of the above. So this is uh, a much larger um, business and, and a business that has multiple sites, but doesn't have tens and tens of sites. They have three major sites. And in one calendar year, they had three different outages. Um, and, and I say calendar year because this is where I'm breaking my rule of 2016 recoveries ever slightly. Uh, so the first incident was the fire, which was the Holborn fire, which was actually an Easter of 2015. Uh, then there's the floods in York and a ransomware attack. Um, so to run through those quickly, the, the Kingsway fire in Holborn, for those that didn't know, there was a, an underground fire along the Kingsway Road. Uh, 2,000 people needed to be evacuated while the firefighters tackled the fire. Um, it was a gas leak and it, and it destroyed underground uh, power cables and it destroyed the, the connectivity. In, in a way, it was lucky it occurred over the Easter weekend. Um, so most businesses were, were, were back up and running within three days by the time they got back in, but there were, there were several that didn't, have, uh, that didn't have power for much, much longer. Um, and you may have heard about this because there was some speculation at the time when the great uh, diamond heist, uh, when the, the folks broke into a, a vault um, in Hatton Garden in London, that happened over the same weekend and there was some speculation that perhaps that fire had been set off deliberately to, to divert attention. Um, I, since I think it's been proven that probably wasn't the case, it was an accidental fire. Uh, but obviously it's the, this is a, a business that had to deal with that. They then had to deal with some really significant flooding in, in York. Um, that was flooding that kept uh, businesses and, 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 and residents out of, uh, out of their buildings for 24 hours. There's then the process of um, cleaning up, removing all the sewage, getting those businesses back up and running. So we're talking about several days of outage um, and it's not a completely not a, 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 a black swan event, but this was the worst flooding that you all could see in, in, in decades. Uh, and then finally, just to, to throw it in, yet another kind of run of the mill uh, ransomware attack. So um, <laughs> yeah, a lot to go through. And I think the lessons here are, do you have the skills in place to recover from a range of different risks? And 
does your service provider have the capacity to cope with multiple implications in parallel? If that's whether that's for you, or if uh, if, if there's a, a large incident going on, like a flood, um, and you're working with someone like us, do you have the capacity to be able to recover plenty of, of other businesses? Um, now, the summary um, of, of the overall messages that we've got from this, if we can leave you with just a couple of things to remember nothing else, uh, make sure you put in methods to limit damage on a ransomware attack. Don't allow greater access than necessary for any of your users. Secure your server rooms um, and make sure you think through your DR plans for options to make sure everyone can work. Um, now, as much as I did promise at the start of this that we would be quick today and we would try to, to get through, I'm afraid we have run long, so um, I promise I will get back to everyone's questions individually. Uh, I'll send this slide deck out. Here are all the resources of the, the bits that we've talked about today. Um, but I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, I look forward to, to, to seeing you all next time. Thank you.